place is becoming unglued, so put your hands together for a kind, awesome human being. First name, Joseph. Last name, Rude. Welcome, Joseph, to the Celebrity Tournament, my friend. Wow. That, that was great, man. That was great. You're here to win the entire Celebrity Tournament when it's all said and done. You know, I saw that video package, and I saw a very familiar face in Mike Rotundo, better known as IRS, and he said that he was here for the winner, winner chicken dinner, and I want to take away that chicken dinner, so yes, I want <laughs> to win this whole shebang. Chavesky's ballet about a certain swan. I'm about to bring him in. That's a conclusion that is foregone, so welcome a kind, talented, humble, down-to-earth human being. Last name or Hurley, first name John. John, welcome, my friend, to the Celebrity Tournament. Well, Abby, thank you very much for that that uh, that that warm welcome. And would it be nice to win this thing? Go to Greece for another week, thirteen grand. Your thoughts, Mr. O'Hurley? You're talking about am I competitive? Let me put it this way: I plan on not only taking first place but second place as well. Last name Murphy, first name Calvin. Calvin, welcome to the tournament, my friend. Damn, you said it just like I wrote it. My goodness. <laughs> I didn't know I was that famous. Thank you for letting me know who I am. I Round number two. Calvin, are you here to win the entire TCAN Celebrity Tournament, my friend? Winning is not an option. I got to be a legend because I won. And I like being a legend, so therefore there's no way that I can lose. I'm here to be here for the duration. I love it, guys. Calvin, my friend, what does it mean to be all in? Uh, please bring up a time in your life in which you were all in as it pertains to a choice you made. Uh, I was one of those individuals that uh, had to prove himself on a continuous basis. Uh, I had to be all in to be committed to excellence. And my high school coach had a theory, 99 and a half just won't do. You got to give me a hundred. And that's what I built my whole career, my whole life on. Or the kids that wrote to me across the nation, I talked to them about total commitment, not being afraid to fail. Uh, Mr. Hurley, what does it mean to be all in? Thank you. It's a very profound question. I wrote a poem. I wrote a line in that poem that has stayed with me my entire life. And I said, I am of those I've touched and the best of what they are. What I meant by that is to say that I've been addicted to great people all my life. So consequently, if I've ever been a success in my life, either as an actor, as a father, it's because I listened to a man elderly. And I said to him, because he was easily one of the most successful people I'd ever met. And I said, to what do you attribute your success? He grabbed my arm and he looked at me and he said, John, you got two choices in your life. You can have an ordinary life or you can have an extraordinary life. It has everything to do with the power of your choices. But somewhere there is a disconnect where the extraordinary becomes ordinary. And I see it in my young son's eyes when he picks up a stick and that stick becomes a, a spear. It becomes uh, something he, get, uh, he can uh, pole vault with. If the extraordinary life, as I see it, has three, three specific elements. It begins with the notion of living by your imagination. Your imagination is the other side of your brain. And that's the one that has all of the pictures the pictures of who you are and what you are supposed to be, what your imagination tells you to do, you have to do. And if you don't, you take one more step towards the ordinary life. Is that by listening to your imagination, it is the only way that God can talk to you. The second element of the extraordinary life is living by contemplation. And by that, I mean just living in the present all of our shame comes from either worrying about the future or by living in the past. And the third element of the extraordinary life is appreciation. It's about recognizing the inherent value and at the same time the inherent brokenness in every human being. So when I talk about the idea of being all in and I go back to that idea of that guy who shook my hand and looked me in the eye so many years ago, I go, he set me on the journey to living in extraordinary. Same topic for uh, Mr. Rudd as well. Uh, I got to ask you the same question, my friend. What does it mean to be all in? I always wondered what made me driven to do things when I didn't have to do it. And I think back to my dad and 
I was mad at him at the time when I was a kid because he he was gone all the time. I had this anger toward him for so many years. And when you get older, you, you realize, no, he was all in. He was committed to his family. I quit school and decided, hey, I'm going to train to be a pro wrestler. And and that image and of my dad coming home on the couch, just enjoying, you know, a few minutes of, of peace and quiet. I think that drove me. This this little thing, this little miracle that's that's mine. And he's not gonna survive without me. I want him to have opportunities I never had. But also I wanna teach him that you never give up your dreams. You don't have to. Luckily I was able to go to a dojo and you know, there was my, my mom and my dad yet again, you know. My dad is there to, you know, help with, with my son for three months. We're all humans and we're all beautiful and we all are going through so much. And no one barely ever stops to look at each other and say, are, are you okay? You can have a plan and that plan might not, might not go to, you know, according to this little list that you wrote down. Like it's the web of weird. It's a old Norse pagan, uh, pagan symbol. And it means that your past, your present, and your future are all predetermined. It's the fate of the Norns. What happened yesterday is supposed to happen because it led you to today. But today doesn't necessarily mean that the future is going to be the same. You can make it better. It can get worse. But you're where you're supposed to be in that moment in time to learn, to feel, to have compassion. Pretty crappy things happening all around you. I feel like your world's crumbling up, you know. But keep focused with what's most important you got your own well-being you have your loved ones and their well-being yeah i can say i go all in on a career choice but that career choice leads me to basically just life experience when something bad happens you don't get down on yourself when it get when the, you know the going gets tough but you persevere and you be the best version of yourself possible at least that's what i want for my son and my daughter and my stepson if you could go back in time and select one historical figure joseph to help during their time of need, who would it be and why? Big fan, big idol of mine was Buster Keaton. Like he had all these different like films and stunts that just stuck with me as, as, as a kid growing up. Uh, and everybody probably remembers when the house fall, you know, and he's standing there. When they transitioned from silent film to regular film, and the, the talkies was what they were called back then. His career kind of disappeared. Like there was a lot of stuff going on personally in his life. Like he had, you know, been going through a divorce. There was creative control within the films he was doing. If I could go back and point him in the right direction, that's 15 years of, of, of stuff. I just wish I could be there. And I wish I could help him so that the world could see what that 15 years would have looked like if he was flourishing. But his 30s comedy shorts get no attention at all. If you're a fan of his work, man, you got to watch a few of them. His, his solo gems were incredible. If I had to pick one, I'd have to go the great Jackie Robinson. Growing up, learning to deal with the phrase, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. I wish that I could have been there during his era to be his bodyguard, to be his protector, just to make people understand what he did and what and who he was to put his life on the line for mankind not just for the black race but for all races the first thing you get over is the awe of being around the jackie robinson and to and to understand when he told you something he wasn't talking to hear himself talk he was trying to give you a foundation for the future and I wanted people to know that I knew a Jackie Robinson, that he personally gave me some in, some information. Now, did I always do as he uh, suggested? Absolutely not. With all the accolades given these people, like Martin Luther King and Muhammad Ali, and and and, and we've seen the screenplays, but did, did people really know the inside of these individuals, what they really felt, what the pain they really went through for mankind? You could see the pain that he he went through. And if I look back and remember what was said to me, it could have alleviated a lot of anger and hurt in my life. When I was a youngster growing up in Norwalk, Connecticut, I was basketball 24-7 from my little basketball court behind Center Junior High School was a building. And there was a gentleman that used to live 
in one of those departments. He asked me, was I Ina Murphy's boy? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, you know, one day you are going to be a mega star. But before that happens, I want you to find out what being a star is all about. Everything is not cut and dry. You've got to go through some things to learn some things to be that star. I did for years a program with the NBA, which was the stay in school program. I remember when I hear this from me also, I heard it from Jackie Robinson. So everything connected. Uh, you, uh, you grew up near New York, about half an hour from New York City, and your brother and you would sneak onto the train to the old MSG. You'd watch the pro games, and then one night you saw Oscar Robertson play, the big O, and he said on the way home, he said, you vowed you'd become a pro basketball player come hell or high water. Absolutely, absolutely. I, 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 you've done your homework. Uh, the yeah. same question, Mr. O'Hurley. If you could go back in time and select one historical figure to help out during their time of need, good sir, who would it be and why? And it was time for my dad and I to spend time together, and it was very important for him to bring me to Fenway Park. The Red Sox were, for me, a connection to my father, um, and now has become a connection to my son. Over the years, I have become close friends with many of the, uh, of the players. Tim Wakefield and I were very, very close friends. He owned a pitch called the knuckleball. And everybody who ever has played the game says Tim Wakefield threw the best knuckleball. Tim and I were the dearest of friends over possibly 20 years. Last year, um, he broke it to me that his wife had uh, pancreatic cancer. And last summer, I invited him to play in one of my charity golf tournaments. And he says, I can't do it. I've got to take Stacy, and we're going around the world to check off the boxes of places that she wants to go. I got a text one morning from NBC Sports, and they said, Tim has a brain tumor. He texted me, and he said, I'm, I'm fine now. I'm good. The, the mass is gone. They, that was on a Thursday night. On Friday morning, Tim was dead. He didn't let anybody know that he had the brain tumor. It was so quiet, and I said I just would, I, I didn't have a chance to say goodbye. And unfortunately, he left a wife behind who was also dying. About three weeks ago, Stacy died. And my regret, my one regret is that I wasn't there to hug him. But I always look back at that final text that he said, when I said, I love you, and he responded, I love you too, bud, is that we have these remarkable things on our cell phones that still has their last messages. It still has the last connection to them. What do I do with this? I can't delete it. Getting it and hearing their voice healthy and happy for the last time changes my life immeasurably. And so I think of Tim with regret for his passing, but in recognition of the fact that he lived extraordinary. John, how does your profession contribute to your personal growth? My job when I learned my sense of humor was to sit at the dinner table that night and make my father laugh. He would laugh like this. And then he would run out of breath and he would go. And it was a gift that I, I think was kind of God sent to me. It was always there, and I always knew it was it was gonna it, it, it was gonna work its way into my life some way. I walk on stage before then, and I say one simple prayer, and I say, "God, let me be surprised." And that's all I say. And what it does is it relaxes me, and it allows me to look everybody in the eye because everybody, somebody on that stage, has my surprise for that. Uh, Mr. Murphy, can you name three possessions that reflect who you are as a person? I was given a beautiful cross from a friend that I wear on every broadcast over the last couple of years. I've had them ask me, why do I wear that cross opposed to not wearing a tie? And of course, that opens up the floodgates for me to tell them why. I left youngsters in my hometown that were more talented than I was, but I was given the opportunity and I want people to know why. I guess is I have another piece of jewelry that was given to me by my father. Now I was fortunate enough, I had two dads. I was raised by my stepfather, two uh, grandfather watches, one from each of them. And of course they've passed away 
So I keep them close to me. And that tells people who I am. I'm a father. Guess what I want people to recognize with me was my baton. Now, but that baton is an instrument of leading. You can see my passion is these youngsters because we can do for other people's children that they can't because they, for some reason, will listen to a stranger before they listen to their own. Uh, Joseph, my friend, the last question of the night is to you. Uh, the question I have for you is which aspects of your personality come to mind when you think of who you are? Which aspects of my personality? Uh, yeah. Patient, irritable. <laughs> Calm, uh, forgiving, uh, compassionate. Um, uh, I like to think that I sit down at a group of people I don't know and I listen and I try to be the last one to talk. That way I'm the most well-informed person in the room. Uh, that way, when everybody else makes a fool of themselves, you can open your mouth and you can't go wrong. <laughs> you, you can't. I feel like I'm just a, a plethora of all these different emotions and uh, personality traits. Uh, Joseph, did you have a nice time tonight, my friend? Yeah, I had a blast. Did, did you have a nice time, my friend? I had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> you had fun tonight, man? Oh, fabulous. It doesn't get any better than this. <laughs>